Hello and welcome back to Rage Gaming and again a new Elden Ring Things You Didn't Know episode. Today we've got some really cool topics to talk about, largely thanks to you guys in the comments as always, with some back and forth, some further testing on my part. Not only has it been a great one for that, but a huge thank you, especially on the last episode, for so many people getting involved. I have so many things to look into, especially in the future episodes, because of the comments of the last video, so thank you. But with that said, let's get into today's episode. Alright then, to kick us off in the first thing of this episode, it's a follow-up from last time because it's probably the most commented thing we had on the previous episode by far, asking the question to do with those moon sorceries. Now basically what I covered in the last episode was how unexpectedly the moon sorceries work as a black hole of absorption. Much like the eternal darkness sorcery which absorbs spells, the moons while moving and actually projectile and actually dealing damage will also act as a black hole, sucking in sorceries, which you might not realize it works that way when you read the description, which says that it will nullify sorceries it collides with. But no, as I showed in my testing, it will literally black hole them in, which is really cool. But the big question was in the comments, what will happen if you shoot two moons at one another? So we went and tested, me and Josh, and we found that it's basically quite simple. One moon absorbs the other, then continues going to hit your target, making this timing of the cast, should you be facing another moon sorcery in a rare scenario, you need to know this. The first moon that is cast will be absorbed by the second moon that is cast. Even if you cast instantly, like 0.1 of a second after the first one, the newest moon will always absorb the oldest, which is a really cool effect, quite interesting to see. It'd be cool if there was sort of a visual flare as it was sucked up or something, but it just sort of pops out of existence. We even chained some back to back and it was pretty cool. But there is another thing about this moon spell that's quite interesting, the Eternal Darkness spell. Again, it absorbs spells of the cast. Turns out the moon actually completely ignores that. It will not be absorbed at all by eternal darkness it seems to be that only other moons can consume moons very logical surely in any case both of these facts are interesting and potentially useful to know next up we have one from Sekiro Dubi, or at least he's the source of it if you weren't aware Elden Ring used to have a different UI, specifically in your health, mana, and stamina bars here. So that's what the UI we have right now is. Let's take a look now at this image from the closed network test before the release of the game and see what the UI looked like back then. Now, I actually played this test and I don't remember this UI, but it is familiar to me from images that I've seen before the game came out. You can see how the health bar, the mana bar, the stamina bar are a lot simpler, a lot less suitable, in my opinion, to Elden Ring's world. The current version has that sort of golden border and underline effect to it, even a bit of gradient on the end of the bar to show where it ends. Those bars just seem so unfinished to me. I, I don't like them at all. A lot of people do like them. And there's even interest for it in regards to modding to make them look like that again. Allegedly, people actually complained about this, this UI for your bars. Uh, after the test ended, people were upset because they thought maybe they weren't suitable, they didn't look good. And apparently they were changed after that. But in my opinion, surely they were never going to look like that. If we look back to, say, Dark Souls 3, you can see the UI there at the top left. Quite similar, isn't it, in, in the concept? The bars are taking up a lot less space on the screen. And while I think the colors are a bit worse there, just something about them, there's still that border, there's still the edging, there's still a bit of design to it beyond that just kind of bland color and bar, and that's it from the closed network test of Elden Ring. So yeah, I just don't think they were ever going to be released in that state. But it's interesting to see how the UI has changed. And I guess I'll ask, do you guys prefer the closed network test version? Maybe you do, and that's fair enough, but I definitely don't. Next up, we have one that's a little bit of a mystery. It's a strange one because we have this special sorcery effect that never made it into the full game and yet was shown in trailers and is even used apparently by one of the summons that we have in game. The large flowers here cast it all the time. For example, it's casting it right now. This kind of star thing where it slams down these shots from the sky after channeling it on a sort of target location. It's got quite an AOE and range to it. That was actually a sorcery that you could have used in the game at one point. In fact, it's in-game, like I said, one of the summons. 
Melina apparently uses it in the boss fight where you summon her here against Morgoth. She might not always do it, but she is capable of casting that sorcery in-game now, which is quite interesting. Again, we were supposed to be able to use this. And how do I know that? Because it was shown in a literal gameplay trailer. In fact, the launch trailer for Elden Ring has this small scene where this woman here is actually casting that spell herself on a target. So why don't we have it in the full game. What's that about? Well, if we take a look at the actual item itself, Miranda's Prayer, this is what we would use to call down the Deluge of Light. It seems like it was actually a tool made up of one of those flowers and had an S scaling in faith and required 43 FP per cast. The description's still there. Thanks to the files of the game, we can see that icon and what it would look like, and also the description of the item. Miranda, maiden of the flower crucible, is said to have been the very first of this breed. So it seems like it comes from a former time in terms of lore in the crucible period before the golden order as we know it now. You can't obtain this in a legitimate way, but technically exists again in the files of the game. And we can see that thanks to River St. Grey, a YouTuber who actually recreated this to try it in game. You can see that they're using the tool as it is indeed a tool to AOE around themselves. Now they're not able to actually target it would seem, but they're able to cast it and the AOE occurs around them as the sort of starting point. All of these things exist in the game, right? The spell of course is being used by the flowers. The tool exists in the files, so why is it we never got it? It's quite strange. I wonder if it'll be introduced again, maybe in the DLC. It's not exactly the most insane spell, but it's strange that we don't have it when it does exist and was shown to us in trailers. Either way, an interesting one, and thank you to Josh for letting me know about this. Moving on then, we have a follow-up from a previous episode to do with Nokron and of course the Finger Slayer Blade and the origins of it. Now we had this conversation about how when at the end of the game we face the Elden Beast, we see the body of Radigan being formed and twisted into a weapon, a nightmarish thing really made from flesh and bone that is then used as a sword against us in the fight with the boss itself. It's incredible, it's gnarly. It's really interesting. But then we looked at the Finger Slayer Blade and the history of that, and intriguingly, how it also looks like that twisted form of Radagon. Maybe that was actually a body that was twisted and formed into a similar style of weapon, maybe by the Elden Beast, maybe by something else. We did speculate about who the body was, but what we're interested in now is what made the Finger Slayer Blade. Maybe it wasn't, say, the Elden Beast or the same order, but maybe. It was Astel, as speculated by Walker96365, which states, It's a malformed star born in the flightless void far away, and once destroyed an eternal city and took away their sky, a falling star of an ill omen. This sky, this starless cave, it still exists, obviously. We're here in Nokron right now. And we can still see that there is this starry sky. And this is the location right down there where we find the Finger Slayer Blade. Maybe it's not referring to this city. Maybe it's not referring to this one over by Noxtella. Maybe it refers to the unnamed city that we find right in front of Godwin, the current Prince of Death. When we return to this city and look at the sky, well... It's obviously not the starry sky that we see in the other two underground areas. This is the only underground area that doesn't quite have that effect, and it's quite murky and horrible here for obvious reason. It's Walker who even speculates that maybe the body that made the Finger Slayer Blade was in fact Godwin's. Now, it's obviously the case that his body still exists, but is greatly transfigured and transformed. Parts of it are no longer man parts. Maybe the lower half of the body, the legs, was used to create that Finger Slayer Blade a long time ago. Further, some interesting notes to do with this sword and its kind of twirling design is there's other weapons that have the same design of very important lore and relevance, such as, say, this one, the Colossal Sword of the Queen. The Glow-Eyed Queen who controlled the Godskin Apostles and the Black Flame faction, the former wielder of Destined Death, her weapon, her sword, has that same twirling pattern. While not fair to say that it's exactly the same, it's undeniably similar, is it not? This point was made by Michael Bradley in the comments. Perhaps it's because it's slightly unfurled that it might not be so obvious a comparison, but I can definitely see it. I also noticed myself how this design is actually reflected a little bit 
In this weapon, the Carrion Regal Scepter from Ranala herself, it has that same kind of spiral shape, but a lot more minimal compared to the other two, where the God Slayers is unfurling and the Sacred Relic Sword, by comparison, is a lot tighter. Is this coincidence? Are these weapons and swords made in a similar way? Let me know what you think of these theories, and a thank you to Walker and Michael for these fantastic comments uh, to talk about in the series. Thank you very much. And for our last thing for today's episode, we have a fantastic comparison comment from someone called YouTube Voice uh, 1050 who noticed some connections to famous swords from history. First up, we have the one that I'm holding right here in my hand. This, of course, being the sword of Saint Trina, who we talk about in the law as potentially being Mikola, who was disguised in some travels he did. That's not relevant here, though. What we care about is the sword itself, and it's very unique and cool design being reflected in the real world. Now, now, YouTube Voice suggests that this is actually inspired by Tizonia, the sword of a Spanish national hero, El Cid, who lived in 1043 to 1099. This man used a straight sword, much like the one we see of Sword Trina here. And when we look at the weapon itself, close up to, say, the crossguard here, we can see that very similar kind of curving in crossguard pattern there with the engravings down the middle of the sword from that point. Further, the shape and bearing of the sword seems very similar in Indeed. So I think that's a very good comparison and one that I could definitely believe. Next and second then is the Uber comparison. The Regalia of Eocade here, which is a really cool straight sword, sadly seeing very little use in the meta of the game due to the bigger version that's just more effective. Which is a shame because it's a really cool design. The copper coloration is not to be confused for rust, but is a conduit for its wielder to move it by their will alone. It's designed for that telepathic combat style. The copper coloration though. Well, YouTube Voice suggests this is likely based on the 2,000 plus year old Chinese bronze sword, the Sword of Gujian. I hope I pronounced that right. Probably not. Miraculously found in near perfect conditions and has a very similar style to it. I looked this one up to have a look into it and apparently it is indeed a bronze sword, but a tin bronze sword, resistant to tarnishing, rarely seen in artifacts of this age. Found in 1965, it was unearthed in an ancient tomb and its design looks incredible and familiar to the regalia of EOK. Almost like it's got that bordering, you've got that really familiar design and sort of style down the middle and center of the blade, and even the actual handle is almost identical. It's a really cool looking weapon, and one that I think, yeah, was definitely inspiration for the regalia here. What a cool comparison. If you guys know what inspired the other weapons of Elden Ring, maybe we could look at some other cool things like this in this series, that'd be awesome. But for now, that is indeed today's episode of Things You Didn't Know in Elden Ring. I've really enjoyed this episode. Some great back and forth and obviously some really interesting comparisons today. If you have anything to add to the topics today or have something that's not been in the series so far that would work as a thing to look at, then let me know down below. For now then, I've been Hollow, you've been you. Thank you for watching. And as always, I'll see you next time. Josh, Cotton, and Hollow with the videos Dropping the humor like a hammer on your tippy toes Bringing entertainment on a daily arrangement To take our insanity and turn it into entertainment Yes, I said entertainment twice To reiterate that it is nice To look into your faces on a mostly daily basis When you let us in your homes to make the whole world a stage Is, uh, goodbye